today we're in week nine, which is actually going to be part B of week eight. And last week we kind of introduced the subtopic of going from good to great. What did Jesus say about going from good to great? And we talked about a book last week titled Good to Great, written by one of the greatest minds in business research. His name is Jim Collins. And the subtitle of the book is Why Some Companies Make the Leap. How is it that some companies can go from from being just an, an average good company to all of a sudden becoming a great company? I don't know about you, but I really enjoy shopping or eating at places that are great. How about you? You just, there are some places in your mind it's it's a it's actually a, an exciting time to go in there and shop or to go there and eat. And so what we found out through this book that Jim Collins really studied over these years, it describes how companies went from being good to great companies and the main reason that certain companies became great was a formula to narrowly focus the company's resources on their field of key competence. In other words, they looked at what do we do well, what don't we do well, let's get rid of the things we don't do well, Let's put all of our resources towards what we do well and just, just stay at it until we are the best at what we do. And then when they do that, we have a better experience when we go to those places, whether it's retail or food or whatever it is that we shop at or eat at. And do you know when I see this, I see the church. And I think the church needs to be a place that we realize what what our key competence is. Our key competence is not to preach politics. Our key competence is not to make people feel bad about their life. Our our competence is, is not to have people come in here and we can beat them up over the head with the Bible. You know what our key competence is? Is that God loves you, He has a plan for your life, He'll forgive you, and He's got a bright future for you. That's what our key core competence is. And you know what I want us to do? I want us to go from good to great. And what great companies do is it's how they deliver the product, right? They turn it into an experience. I've said this before, we like going to Wegmans. We get dressed up like it's date night to go to Wegmans because of the experience of going to Wegmans. We like going there. I want church to be the same way. I want people to come to church and I want them to walk in and say, you know what? They're focused on what we do well. And what is that? Preach the message of Jesus Christ that he died for everybody. And it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, how many times you've done it, or who you did it with. God's got a plan for your life. Come on. That is what we do best. And I want to make sure that we understand that God's calling all of us. Not just Summit as as an organization, or me as the pastor, or our team, or the dream team. He's called every one of us to make a difference. He's called every one of us because every one of us have influence somewhere with somebody. It's why we ask you to be an inviter. I I don't know the people you know and I want you to be an inviter. Invite people to come to this life-giving experience so they can find out what it means to have a great experience in church and have an encounter with God. Just just all the preparation that goes on so that you have a life-giving experience. The, The preparation that went on just to bring this song to you. Right? How many of you felt like you were at a concert? You, you were sitting there going, wow, the whole team came together. Can you imagine bringing your friend to church? They'd be like, is this church? This doesn't feel like church. How many of you love it when it doesn't feel like church? In other words, what people think in their mind. You know, church, a lot of people think it's like going to the dentist. You know, let's go to church. Okay. Right? That's when you wear your big watch so you can see what time it is, right? We have the ability to change the world around us. Maybe not change the whole world, but the people we come in contact with. And for us to go from being good Christians to great Christians, it takes full dependence and reliance and trust on God. In other words, just you ever heard of a trust fall, right? Where, where if I were to stand here and I was to turn backwards and I was to fall and I was to trust you to catch me, which ain't happening, by the way. <laughs> it takes a lot for somebody to, uh, to trust somebody like that. 
And, and that's what God wants us to learn to do, to become in complete reliance on him so that we become people of great faith so that we can affect the world around us. Great faith doesn't change the church. Great faith changes the world. And that's really one of the missions here at Summit. I heard about this guy named Daryl Pace. He was an Olympic gold medalist. And he was to give an archery exhibition in New York City's Central Park. And the event received a lot of coverage from the news stations. Shooting steel-tipped hunting arrows, Pace punctured bullseyes without a miss. Bullseye after bullseye, different target after different target, hitting them with precision. And then he asked for a volunteer from the, from the people that were viewing, and he said, all you have to do is hold this apple waist high while I shoot it. Nobody responded. Finally, an ABC correspondent whose name was Josh Howe took a bold step forward, and he stood there, a small apple in his hand, and the article says a bigger one in his throat. Obviously, he was little concerned. Pace took a shot from 50 yards away, and everybody was holding their breath, and the whack, a clean hit, exploded the apple in his hand before hitting the target bullseye directly behind the apple. Of course, everybody let their breath go and began to applaud, and they applauded Josh for being the one who stood there and held the apple. He was all smiles until his cameraman approached him with a strange look and said, man, I'm sorry, Josh, but I was having problems with my viewfinder. I didn't get it. Could we do that again? <laughs> now, how do you know it's one thing to have trusted God and gone through something and seen him come through? It's a whole other thing to say, hey, let's do that again. Because it takes total reliance. And you see, they applauded Josh, but yet it was the archer who did everything that was magnificent. All Josh did was stand there. They were applauding Josh because he had faith enough to see the apple explode rather than see foot, the arrow in his arm. And this is what God is calling us to be. I mean, really, that's good to great. Wouldn't you say that's good to great? It's one thing, it's good to stand there and watch. It's great to be the person that holds the apple because now I'm reading an article about it and we're still talking about what Josh did. So how many of you are ready to go from good to great in your faith? And really, it's not going from good to great because that was the title of the book. In faith, it's growing from good to great. We grow from good to great. We don't go, we grow in our faith. And I shared last week from Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to cover a little bit of last week and hopefully add to that before the service is out. In Matthew chapter 8, we talked about a Roman army officer who had come to Jesus and begged him for help. When this Roman officer came, he came to Jesus and he was begging him for help for a beloved employee that was at home dying. And Jesus responded, I'd love to help. In other words, he said, will you? And Jesus said, I will. And as Jesus began to make motion to go to his home, the Roman officer stopped him and said something that got a reaction from Jesus. And so today, I want to take some time and look at the reaction of Jesus. We read the whole passage last week, but I want to take some time today to look at the reaction Jesus had. We'll read a little bit and then we'll see that. And I think this reaction is something we all should take notice of and we should study for our own benefit. So this is what he said when Jesus said, I'll come. The Roman officer said, Lord, who am I to have you come into my house? I understand your authority. It's very key in this passage of scripture that we see that this person understood Jesus' authority. And now he gives us a picture of how authority works in the realm that we can see. He said, I'm a man who walks under authority. I have people over me. And I have authority over soldiers who serve under me. I can tell one to go and he'll go, and another one to come and he'll come. I direct my servants and they'll do whatever I ask. So I know that all you need to do is stand right here 
and command healing over my servant and he will be healed. What he is saying is, in the natural, what I can see with these eyes is I have people that serve me, I have soldiers under me, and I say, hey, you go take care of that, you guard that, you make sure that's taken care of. I can tell my servants, look, I'd like the pool cleaned up or whatever it is he's got going on at his house, and his servants take care of it. And he knows when I say it, they do it. And he said, that's what I can see, but you have authority in a realm that I cannot see. And this is what he's saying, I know the sickness is a curse. And it comes from the unseen realm, not from the seen realm. And I know you have authority in the unseen realm. And when you have authority in the unseen realm, it changes what I can see. And all you need to do is speak. And I know I may not see it, but everything's going to begin to move in the unseen realm. I understand your authority. And look what it says. And Jesus was amazed when he heard this. And this is the reaction I want us to spend a few minutes on. Jesus was amazed when he heard this. And he said to those who were following him, I can guarantee this. I haven't found faith as great as this in anyone in Israel. And Jesus told the officer, go, what you believe will be done for you. And at that moment, something moved. Authority had been used and that sickness had to leave because Jesus spoke. Not because he came to the house, but because he spoke into that realm. That servant was healed. I, when I read this and I see Jesus was amazed, I'm thinking to myself, how do I get Jesus to be amazed at me? Because a lot of times Jesus is amazed at me, not because I have great faith, just because I'm like, he's like, really? I mean, I think a lot of times when I'm talking to Jesus, he looks over at the Father and goes, seriously? <laughs> but I don't want him to be disappointed in amazement. Come on, somebody. I want him to be overwhelmed in my faith in him and be amazed that no matter what the pushback is, no matter what the problem is, no matter what's going on that's negative in my life, whether it comes from the doctor, the banker, a relationship, whether it comes from a teacher, whether wherever the pushback comes from, that I know all will be well because God will help me in that situation. I want him to be overwhelmed with me. As a matter of fact, in other translations where it says Jesus was amazed, it says this, he marveled, he was impressed, he was surprised, he wondered, he was astonished, he was taken aback, he was shocked, and he was stunned. How do you want to have that kind of faith? That Jesus is amazed at your ability to not be moved by the problem. To not talk yourself out of what he said versus what the doctor is saying, versus what your checkbook is saying, versus what the, you know, a teacher says your child has a learning disability. You know what I can say to you is that whenever there's a report that comes at you that's negative, that God Almighty says these words, all will be well. I want everybody to say that on the count of three. One, two, three. How many of you believe that? How many of you trust God enough to believe all will be well? When we trust God this way, the Bible says there are, he's amazed. He's awestruck by our ability to look beyond the pushback and to look into the realm of faith. It's time to grow from good to great. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, 6, the writer says this. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, we're, we're really focusing on what Jesus said, but we've jumped over into the epistles and we've just taken a quick moment to look beyond the epistles or beyond the, the, the gospels into the epistles that one of the writers wrote, one of the apostles wrote, and he said this, it's impossible to please God without faith. And so what we know is that what the Roman soldier did in what he said, you don't even need to come to my house. Isn't that mind-blowing? And Jesus is like, well, I don't need to come to your house. No, you don't even need to come to my house. I think Jesus, man, he got more faith than I do. You don't 
even need to come. Just speak. Is anybody getting what I'm trying to show you this morning? No matter what the pushback is, God is able as long as you'll just believe. If Josh can hold an apple while an arrow probably traveling at 150 miles an hour, who knows how fast that thing is traveling, so fast he probably never saw it. All he felt was the apple disintegrate in his hand. And I guarantee you when he felt that apple, he was like, was that my hand, my arm? Because, you know, he probably had shadow pain, right? You ever had shadow pain? It didn't happen, but you're like, ooh. We have to come to the place where we trust God. Ready for this? Where we trust God so much that no matter when we ask and we believe, whether there's an answer that comes that we hear clearly or not, we know it's going to be okay. See, we're always looking for that moment where God drops it on us and we say, I heard clearly. I want you to know whether you heard clearly or not, God's still on the case and he's still working on your behalf, even if it's a non-answer. As a matter of fact, I see a non-answer from God as him saying, there's time for us to work this out. But our role is to continue to seek God until. Until what? Until you get and answers. As a matter of fact, we have a perfect example of that over in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 22. A Canaanite woman ran to Jesus. Now, I want you to get this picture. First of all, Roman soldier, not part of the covenant. He's not a Jew. He's a Roman. This is a Canaanite woman. She's an Arab. She's not part of the covenant. She's not a Jew. And she is booking it towards Jesus. I mean, she is booking it fast, so fast to him, there is like a cloud of dust behind her. And Jesus is standing there, and he sees this woman running at her, and she is shouting at the top of her voice, Son of David! Well, she must not have known who Jesus was because he was son of Joseph. Why was she calling him son of David? Because she was recognizing him as the descendant that was promised from David. And she was saying, Savior. She was already announcing before she got to him, I know who you are. I know who you are. The same way that the soldier said, all you have to do is speak because I know who you are. Come on, how many of you know who he is? I know who you are. Son of David! That got Jesus' attention. See, he knew. She understood. Have mercy on me. My daughter has a demon. Is in a terrible condition. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Another translation said she paid no attention to her. She is dealing with stuck-up Jesus. She's dealing with better than you, Jesus. Or is there something bigger going on? His disciples came to him and begged him, Why do you keep ignoring this woman? Send her away. Then Jesus replied back to his disciples, I've been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He was saying this, I've not been sent to the Palestinians. I've not been sent to the Romans. I have been sent to Israel. I'm not paying attention to her because she's not part of the covenant. He was not saying that because he was stuck up Jesus. He was saying that because he was testing her ability that no matter what he said, she was going to have faith. That no matter what the pushback was, she was going to continue to seek him. Look, at this moment the woman fell at his feet. She went from running at him, being over next to his side, she got all up in his grill. She got all up in his business and dropped in front of him and said, you will walk no further. And she said, help me, sir. I want everybody to shout that out just like she did on the count of three. One, two, three. Help me, sir. And Jesus answered, of course I'll help you. I help the Roman soldier, I will help you too. No. He said it didn't right to take the children's food and throw it to a dog. You're offended for her. 
He was dealing with a cultural issue that was understood at that time, and that's that the Jews felt that all the Palestinians were dogs. That's how they were referred to. This was a cultural, racial issue that needed to be dealt with. Jesus wasn't there to fix that. He was there to represent heaven. He was simply referring to the racial divide and the issue in the black and white manner, which it was always referred to. And look at how she responds. That's true, sir. She understood it was a cultural issue. She did not take it as a slight. She said, that is true. But even the little dogs eat the leftovers that fall from their master's table. How many of you know she's getting Jesus' attention right now? You might call me a dog, but one thing I know, dog owners love their dogs. Come on, somebody. Any dog owners in here? Come on. Any cat owners in here? Be free in Jesus' name. Come out. Did you feel that? <laughs> I'll tell you what happens to us people who love animals. We do things with those animals at home that other people are like, that is disgusting. I have three dogs of my own, my wife and I and my daughter, we have three dogs and then my daughter and my son-in-law have bought a dog and they leave it for us, it's our grand dog. We have four dogs. And those dogs run around the house and they have a great time. They jump on our bed and they, you know, they're just, they're just part of the family. As a matter of fact, let me tell you how much I love my dogs. I can be sitting at my table eating from my plate and my daughter will reach over to grab a french fry off my plate. And I'm like, what are you doing? Don't you touch my food? And then the dog walks up. I'm little lacy here. Would you like a french fry? See, this is what she's referring to. Even the little dogs are treated just like family, and I'm coming to you, dog or not. I'm going to get something off of your plate. I'm not moving. Can you see her going from good to great? And look what he says. Jesus said to her, you are a woman of great faith. What you want will be done for you. And at that very moment, boom, her daughter was healed. What is it that we see here? Another account of an outsider, a non-Jew, except that she was not taking a no answer as an answer. She was not, not no, but a no, an, a no answer. There was no answer. Remember, he didn't reply. She wasn't going to say that's not, no, I'm staying here till I get my answer. And she was prepared to do whatever it took to show him, I believe you can do this. The armor officer and the desperate mother had something in common. Both believed that Jesus could do what he had done before and what he said he could do, but they took it a step further and placed a demand on him, not just that he could, but that he would. There is a big gap between could and would. Let me say it to you this way. Not Jesus can, but he will. Not that he can, but he will. You ever been around somebody and, and, and maybe they had a lot of resources and, and, and you knew that they were, they were wealthy? And, and you just knew they had so much money that, that, that if they wanted to, they could just write you a check and completely change your life and it wouldn't even hurt them. You ever been around that? And so you go around and say, well, they can, they can. But if they said, I will, how many of you would be like, we went from can to will, baby. When you go to will, suddenly, now we find out what it's like to be in the possession of their blessings. We find out what it's like to have their will. See, God wants us to go from not these two individuals who were non-Jews went from not just he can or he could, but he would and he will. And that is the difference between good to great faith. It's not, I believe Jesus can. I bet you if I came in here and said, how many of you believe God can do anything? We'd probably get a unanimous, yes. How many of you believe he'll do it for you? And see, these examples are what God's trying to show us. This is how he wants us to approach him. We're not outsiders. 
We're even better than Jews. We're children of the living God. We're inheritors of the kingdom. Everything that is his is mine. And the Bible says I'm to boldly come before the throne of grace that I might find help and mercy in the time of my need. The Bible says he's a very present help in the time of trouble. What does that mean? God doesn't run from your trouble. He gets in the middle of your trouble. And when he's in the middle of it, he's just waiting for you to say, I know you can, but I'm believing that you do it here and now. Faith begins where the will of God is known. When the centurion came and asked him about healing a servant, In the King James, it says, he says, I will. And faith begins where the will of God is known. When you know God's will, you can believe in it. And Jesus was God's will in action before us. Every time we see Jesus, this is what we see. We see healing. We see forgiveness. We see somebody who comes along and gets in the middle of people's problems and makes it better than what it was before he arrived. This is what we see in Jesus. And Jesus came for one reason, to be a reflection of the Father's will. And let me say it to you this way. If he did it for one, he'll do it for you. And if you read it in the Bible and Jesus did it, I'm telling you, if you will come to him like the Roman soldier, if you will come to him like the little Canaanite woman and say, I'm getting up in your grill and I'm believing, call me a dog or not. I want to eat from your plates. The Bible says he will. Uh, Corey Tim Boom said this, faith is like a radar that sees through the fog the reality of things at a distance that a human eye cannot see. What does radar do? Radar goes out, it bounces off of something and comes back, but you can't see it. You can't see it with the naked eye. But radar sends pulses out and those sound waves come back to the radar and say, hey, something's out there in the distance you can't see. And that's exactly what your faith does. When you're in the middle of a crisis or you're in the middle of believing for something, and it doesn't just have to be a crisis, it might just be something like a promotion, not a promotion crisis but you just need to go up whether it's crisis or or you're believing for something more or you just want to answer the call of God on your life when you believe you can't see what God sees so you send your faith out it goes through the fog of life it hits the answer and the beam comes back and bounces off of you and you know what that says everything's going to be all right you may not be able to see it but it's right out there beyond your sight When the doctor gives you a bad report, send the radar of faith out there. You know what will come back? I'm the God that heals you. When when the bank account doesn't look like it's going to provide for your family, send the radar of faith out. You know what will come back? I am your provider. When you feel like you've messed up so many times in the same area and there's no way God will forgive you for that act again, you send faith out there. You know what will come back? I'm your redeemer and I died for you and I forgive you. All will be well. What did Jesus say? You see, going from good to great when it comes to faith is the person who relies, who will hold the apple and say, Jesus, I trust you. It might be a little uncomfortable. Your mind might say, He's not going to do it. But you believe. All will be well. I heard about this man who fell off a cliff. And as he was falling and sliding, he managed to grab hold of a tree limb on the way down. And there he was dangling on this tree limb. And he yelled up to the top of the cliff. He said, hey, is anybody up there? And he heard a voice come back, yes, I'm here. It's Jesus the Lord. Do you believe me? Yes, Lord, I believe, I really believe, but I I can't hang on to this branch much longer. I need help. That's all right. If you really believe, you have nothing to worry about. I will save you. Just let go of the branch. A long pause ensued, and the man yelled, Is there anybody else up there? (laughs) 
Have you ever been there? You're hanging on? You're hanging on to what you've been taught? You've been hanging on to the scripture? You're believing what God has said in you? But the natural realm is forcing you to look for another answer. Come on, somebody. You hang on. And when God says let go, you let go. Because if he did it for one, he'll do it for you. And there has to be this level of trust. It's time to not go from good to great, but grow from good to great. The cornerstone of Christianity is faith. Webster Dictionary defines faith as the belief in the historic truthfulness of the scripture narrative. So we believe in the story. And then we believe that that story is of supernatural origin of its teachings sometimes called historical and speculative faith. We believe in the historical process. All the stories we just read are historical stories of faith. But speculative faith is what God did for them, he'll do for me. See, I speculate if he did it once, he'll do it again. If he did it in history, he'll do it in my present. Come on, somebody. And this is what true faith is. Alistair McGrath said this, Faith is not something that goes against the evidence, it goes beyond it. See, we don't deny the doctor's report. We don't deny that there might be an issue in our marriage. We don't deny the situation and act like it doesn't exist. What we say is it exists, but all will be well. Not it exists, I don't know what I'm going to do. Life is going to fall apart. This is the end. It's over. I mean, the truth is, if we just add it up in here, how many times everybody said it's over, and then it wasn't over, how many times would we have said, I'm never going to get through this, and then you got through it? Well, that must mean God must still be on the throne in spite of you saying you're not going to get through it. Now, what happens if you just say, I'm going to get through this in Jesus' name? Now you enjoy the ride. I just want to take a minute and, and look at a contrast between the officer and the mother versus some pretty important Jews. Jesus' disciples, men who walked with Jesus, you would think they would be people of great faith. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 23 is a quick story. Jesus and his disciples all got into a ship and they began to cross over to the other side. I just want you to remember that. They were crossing over to the other. They had a destination. They had a place they were going. And Jesus, being exhausted, went below to the stern of the ship and fell into a deep sleep. And suddenly, a violent storm developed. Well, of course, when Jesus goes to sleep, the storm comes. With waves higher than the ship, yet Jesus continued to sleep soundly. The disciples rushed below and woke him up, shouting, Lord, save us! We're going to die! Now, does that sound anything like that woman, that mother? Does that sound anything like that Roman soldier? These were his followers, his disciples. We're going to die. But Jesus reprimanded them and said, Why are you gripped with fear? Why so little faith? And he went up on the deck and he spoke to the storm, Be still! And just like in the Roman soldier's incident, just like in the Canaanite woman's incident, in this instant, instantly, the storm became perfectly calm and the disciples were astonished by this miracle and said to one another who is this man even the wind and the waves obey him my thought is this evidently hanging around with Jesus will not give you great faith any more than coming to church will give you faith it's not being here it's believing here Being present won't give you faith. It's believing while you're present. Faith comes by hearing what I'm preaching, you're hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing what the Bible says. There's only one source of faith. Look, I drive a gasoline vehicle, I have a diesel tractor. My gasoline vehicle can only get its power source from one fuel gasoline. If I put diesel in my gasoline car, it's going to ruin the engine. 
If I put gasoline in my diesel tractor, it will ruin the engine. So I have to get my fuel source from the correct place for each individual operating system. And for you to have faith, there's only one place you can get it. It's not church. It's the Word of the living God. It's the Scriptures. It's what we're reading that gives you faith. And so it's not being here that gives you faith. It's believing here that gives you the faith. The soldier and the mother believed, but the disciples did not believe. How do we know they believed? By what they said. What did the, what did the soldier say? You don't need to come to my house. Drop that bomb right here, baby. What did he say? To, what, did, what did the Canaanite woman say? I'm not going anywhere. Dog or no dog, I'm eating from your plate. Come on, somebody. How do you want to be those two people? But here we have the disciples who are his followers. And what they say? We're going to die. And Jesus is like, yikes. Your faith is revealed by your words. When trouble comes and you go, it's going to be all right. When the plane begins to literally flap its wings, you look out and the wings going up and down. And you look out and you go, Those wings could break off, and this plane's still going to make it, because I'm on it. You say, that sounds weird. Well, I got a choice. Make it or not make it. I'm going to make it. And if my words have to line up with this, and they go contrary to culture, so be it. So be it. You know why? I want to go from good to great in my faith. There's two things I want to share with you before we leave here. It's not the size of your faith. Too many people think, well, I don't have enough faith. The disciples came to Jesus. You're going to put this on the screen. Luke chapter 17, 6. One day the apostles came to the Lord and said, we need more faith. Tell us how to get it. And Jesus said, if your faith were only the size of a mustard seed. Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, it is not the quantity of your faith. It's the quality of your faith. If I came to you with a pebble that was this big and I handed it to you and say, hey, I got this for you. You'd say, okay, are we in preschool now? Because to a preschooler, that pebble's valuable, isn't it? But if I came to you with a diamond that was that size, there ain't no woman in here didn't just smile. And I said, this is for you, you'd say, yes, it is. Why? They both were the same size. Come on, somebody. It wasn't the quantity, it was the quality. And Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say, you can say, and mountains will move.